Welcome, welcome everyone. I see that we are starting and our participant number is growing. So how exciting. I welcome everyone to our Black and Climbing Accessing Executive Roles panel. This is our final event in our Black History Month series and we are certainly ending it with a bang. My name is Tatiana Sims and I'm a filmmaker and animation production coordinator at Marvel Studios. And it is an honor to be introducing our moderator this evening, this evening Nathy Shaw. Senior Director, Academy Gold Inclusion and Alumni Programs at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Please engage with us using the comment section and use the Q&A icon for any questions we will ask our panelists at the end. Mithi, the floor is yours to start our discussion. Thank you, Tatiana. Welcome everyone. And one of the things that I know Tatiana is proud of, but might not have mentioned. Um, yes, so I'm the Senior Director of our Academy Gold Inclusion and Alumni Programs, and Tatiana is a proud alumnus from the Academy Gold Rising Program, um, class of 2018, is that right? I That's see. correct. So we're so happy to be here um, and really excited to partake with um, this organization and the professionals that are here today. So without further ado, we've got some great speakers today. Um, and I know there's going to be lots of questions. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce them one by one, give a little brief background and bio of them. Um, and we're going to do it a little bit out of order for all those folks that um, typically will do it alphabetically by last name. Um, but we're going to do it alphabetically in reverse order by last name. So I'm going to start with one of our panelists, Ms. Um, Carrie Twig, who, if you want to unmute your video, Carrie comes to us. Um, she spends a lot of her time focusing on um, content that takes urgent cultural questions confronting America and the world. She is a co-founder and head of development for Culture House Media, a black, brown, and women-owned full-service premium film and television production company. She also leads their consultancy work, collaborating with major studios and creatives to ensure that their products are culturally productive. Um, as I mentioned, she really focuses on that content. So prior to this, um, she spent 10 years in politics including serving as a special assistant to President Obama and director of public engagement for then Vice President Biden. So she's focused on challenging our status quo with media narratives. She is an expert in crafting engaging, socially relevant and politically resonant stories and has, you can find her on stage in um, formats such as TEDx and Southwest by Southwest. Um, welcome everyone, round of applause for Carrie Twig. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Fantastic. Thank you for being here, Carrie. Um, next up, we have Janae Marable. Janae is a creative executive at Higher Ground. She earned her BA in screenwriting from UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television and has interned across the industry at places like ABC Comedy Development, E1 Entertainment. She's worked in live music production, photography, advertising, TV development and production. And after garnering much attention through um, an animated project, mapping project, she worked her way to from music videos, including Five Seconds of Summer, Beyonce, and more, um, to TV, as an example, Dave on FX. She currently sits on the founding junior board for Young Entertainment Activists to continue to push for diversity and inclusion in the entertainment industry. Welcome, Janae. Hi, so excited to be here. <laughs> um, we are happy to have you here. Next up is Khalid Jordan. Um, Khalid Jordan is director of development um, and he brings his keen eye for talent and commitment um, to elevated storytelling over at Macro Television Studios. Khalid joins us prior um, from Warner Media, specifically Warner Horizon, where he was the manager of drama and comedy development. And prior to that, he was also the development manager for Mass Appeal under multi hyphenate filmmaker Sasha Jenkins. And he's began his career as an agent trainee at, at um, William Morris Endeavor, which I'm excited to ask him questions about that for everyone in the room. Spending time both in East and West Coast offices, he has a BA in radio, t television, and film with a concentration in television production from Howard University. Welcome, Khalid. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Um, and then next up, we've just got wonderful people here today. Bettina Fisher. Senior Director for Educational Initiatives at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Also my partner in crime, because we work in the same place. Um, in 2015, she launched the Academy's first annual Careers in Film Summit. I believe they are on their seventh year now. 
Um, and this great um, film festival um, offers informs youth about the fast jobs in the film industry. Fast forward two years, she was an integral part of the launch of the Academy Gold Rising Internship Enhancement Program, which she still runs today and co-leads. So um, she's still working on that. In addition, she oversees um, a plethora of Academy's educational outreach programs and partners with organizations such as NALEAP, the National Association of Latino Independent Producers, New Filmmakers LA, the Writers Guild Foundation, Austin Film Festival, and a variety of more organizations. She previously, in her previous career, has worked as a producer and director on such, um, with such organizations such as the National Public Radio, otherwise known as NPR, um, where she's worked on shows such as the Wynton Marsalis Making the Music and Billy Taylor's Jazz at the Kennedy Center. Um, she also um, has been working with um, higher education institutions such as American University, where she was the director of strategic programs and partnerships, and there she launched the Real Journal Journalism Film Festival. She has been a juror for New Filmmakers LA, the Best of um, NFMLA Awards, and the Pan-African Film Festival. Additionally, she's also, I mean, she just has a plethora, just like everyone here, has produced numerous student short films. Um, and more recently, she um, produced a film that featured Johnny Depp, Laura Dern, David Lynch, J.K. Simmons, Jade Pettyjohn, Penelope, Penelope Ann Miller, Chad Coleman, among others. And then lastly, she is a very active board member. She sits on the board for Aspire, um, also the Academy for Social Purpose and Responsible Entertainment. She's a member of the Cal State University Entertainment Alliance, as well as sits on the advisory board members of Media U. Welcome, Bettina Fisher from the Academy. Thank you, thank you for having me. Absolutely. And then I believe our final panelist, wait till they get everybody, Janae Desiree. Janae is a director of script. Sorry. Oh, wait, there's someone else too. Who am I missing? I was just saying hi. <laughs> Oh, okay, great. Janae Tesri is a director of scripted programming at Array Filmworks, um, which is a production company founded by filmmaker Ava DuVernay. Um, is dedicated to the amplification of images by people of color and women of all kinds. If you haven't looked at this organization, you should be looking at it right now. Um, Janae bring, began her career in unscripted while working at, um, at Radical.media on the Dean of Invention for Planet Green. From there, she went on to ABC News All Media, working as an associate producer on the news magazine shows for Discovery Network channels. And in 2014, she joined Participant Media, transitioning to the narrative film space. She has experience working in unscripted, narrative, and animation across television and film, um, as well as podcast. Prior to joining Array in 2020, Janae was an agent also in the media finance group at Creative Artisan Agency, CAA. Janae graduated from Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, with a degree in communication and a double minor in Africana Studies and Women and Gender Studies. Welcome, Janae. Nice to be here. Fantastic. I'm going to do the round of applause because you can't hear everybody. All right, let's dive in. I mean, um, I know I spoke really quickly through everyone's bios, but you can see we have such an exciting, accomplished group of speakers here today. And I think we really want to dive in with the question, you know, you all are where you are today. When you began your careers, did you always know that you wanted to be an executive in Hollywood or was that something that was transformative during your career path? Love to hear if you knew it and you aspired to it and you achieved it or how you got to where you are today. And I'll open up to whoever would like to answer that first. I'll go first. Um, when I, um, as you stated in my, um, when I started um, in, the entertainment industry, I started in documentary filmmaking. I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker and producer. So I was always on the freelance producing side of that. Um, and it wasn't until I moved here and uh, after working as an assistant, starting my career all over again as an assistant to get into the narrative space that I had a full understanding of what the opportunities were in entertainment um, in New York. It's very different. It is, uh, you know, it's it's unscripted, it's freelance, it's news, it's more grassroots on the ground. Um, so you don't really see that many um, executive roles. You know, a lot of those roles are in the marketing side or the people that are in California that you never really see. Um, and it wasn't really until I was in that position that I saw the people that I worked for and looked up to and, and, um, and that I saw that there was an opportunity. And for me, no matter if it was being a filmmaker, a producer, an executive, it was always about 
making sure that I was telling stories that I felt were reflective and representative of the world. Um, so again, in, in my being an assistant, it wasn't until that point that I realized that there was a path as an executive in Hollywood. Um, I'll jump in with the total kind of, oh, I'm sorry, Patina. Go ahead, go ahead, Katie. I'll go after you. <laughs> well, I was just going to jump in with the short and sweet, like, girl, I didn't know what an executive was in this business. Like, I literally had no thoughts about Hollywood whatsoever. I worked in policy and politics for, as you said in my intro, for many, many years. And and so, no, I didn't have aspirations around what a particular job title or job or like stature around a job. And even when I transitioned into filmmaking and into this world, I still wasn't too hung up on uh, on job titles. I was very I was at that point very clear that you can have a job title and hate the job. Um, and so which is a lesson that you will learn as you go. Right. Um, and so I, I, I was certainly not overly fixated on how that would be. Okay, I was next. Um, well, I actually was, I consider myself sort of a late bloomer. I moved to 2012 uh, with the desire of actually being a screenwriter. And so when I got here, I ended up winning um, the uh, Hollywood Black Film Festival Picture Bond. So I thought I was on my way as a screenwriter. But then I realized I needed a day job because LA is extremely expensive. So uh, a friend of mine who I had worked with at American University, um, he was a professor there and we used to host Oscar parties all the time. And he also is an Oscar uh, member, an Academy member. He invited me to a screening and I walked into that theater at the Academy and there was the two huge Oscars on both sides. And I just, it was like magic <laughs> because I was a huge fan of movies. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I can't believe I've gone from, you know, having Oscar parties in Virginia and Maryland, and now I'm walking into this magical theater. So when I got home, I decided to research a lot more about the Academy because I thought the Academy was just the Oscars. But in fact, they have a library, an archive, they were doing educational programs with students. And I had worked with students at American University and Wake Forest, and even at my job at NPR. So I applied and I, I guess it was about four interviews later, it's the most I've ever interviewed for a job. <laughs> and about three or four months later, I finally got the job as director of education initiatives. And I've been here ever since. Um, I think for myself, uh, definitely didn't know I wanted to be an executive. Um, I think to, you know, Carrie's point, I didn't know that that was really a, a job. Like, I think, yes, hindsight, obviously someone has to buy these projects that you that you see. Um, but in school, I definitely was more in like physical production. Um, when I thought I wanted to be a showrunner, uh, then I thought I wanted to be a director. I thought I wanted to be a DP at one point. So I definitely went through like different iterations of it. Uh, and then I got to WME and saw the agency world and that kind of really opened up a different uh, perspective of just like, okay, here's like influence, here's uh, people who are like really kind of forcing sales or like pitching clients and really, um, you know, uh, have, having their hands deep in, in the webs of that in that sense. So, and, and looking at not really seeing too many people that look like me on the other side, you know, there were like two agents at the time, Charles King and uh, EJ Johnson, like there was like, you know, literally two, Eric Reed, um, but, you know, looking at that, you know, I think there was a little bit of sipping the Kool-Aid. I think I naturally kind of, it made sense. Like it, it uh, I don't know, it just it was a certain will that clicked in my brain. So I was like, okay, I could see this, but um, definitely felt to be more creative at the end of the day. You know, it was definitely like once the deal is done, it's like, you know, next client, you really are, you left that process. Um, certain agents stick with it a little bit more, you know, others don't, but that's definitely, I think, um, I started leaning into the more creative executive side as far as like studios and networks and, 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 you know, kind of pursuing that route. So, yeah. I definitely did not. Cause I ended up in podcasting and studied screenwriting. So definitely was a journey to get here. 
Um, and I think what really changed it is I kind of went from wanting a really strategic path to just like letting curiosity kickstart my career. And that's like what I really was like made sure to focus on um, and what landed me where I am. And it was just a lot of questions because I didn't see myself anywhere where I wanted to be. And so it was kind of just creating those um, pictures for myself and because there was no mirror yet. But now I see there's more and more of that showing up. And that's really exciting for people coming up after. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. And yeah, it's a great point to bring up. It's, you know, I, I noticed from all of it, it wasn't a direct, yes, I wanted to be an executive and I knew it from the beginning. Um, but yeah, to the audience, like we didn't have this, we didn't have this room to look at. So how different of a path you all might be able to have in a more accelerated path, learning about how to get to be an executive sooner rather than later. Um, so speaking of career paths, I'm going to jump to Carrie. Um, cause out of the bunch, I think you were one of the ones, you know, having a career in a different career path in, um, politics and policy for 10 years and a quite successful one. So if you could share for the, the folks in the room that are looking to career shift, um, what were some of the, you know, what were some of the turning points for you? How did you make that shift and what advice would you have for career shifters in the room? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I will tell you the story of my, my career shift and it will sound so much more elegant than it actually was because now I have the benefit of hindsight. So I tell people this story, but I'm always very strong. I'm strongly caveat it with the, uh, with the fact that it all makes sense now, as I'm saying it for, as, as something I did, but at the time it was just sort of like, you know, um, so it's interesting and it's so, it's so good to have someone from higher ground here, uh, to really emphasize this point. But, you know, I, I'm someone who has been animated by the idea of changing society my entire life since I was a very young person. Um, I asked my mom what government was when I was about eight years old. She told me it's old white men sitting in a room deciding how free you are. And that is still the most concise and accurate definition I've ever heard. And I was like horrified by that answer, right? Because I was being indoctrinated in my good Midwestern suburban school that was like, this is the freest country in the world and blah, 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 and such and such. And so when she said that to me, and it was sort of like a throwaway comment, she, we were driving down the highway, like I remember it super vividly, you know? Um, and, and so I became determined to be one of those people and to know who those people were. So I was the nerd who was like writing my city council people at 16 and was like, um, excuse me, following up on my letter from last week. Um, and just became obsessed and wanted to work at the White House. And eventually did, you know, politics is an industry that moves very, very quickly, as we have all lived through over the course, we're living through this week, right? Um, but we it, it's it's a fundamentally an industry of profound and rapid change. And so you're able to accelerate your career really quickly. I thought I would spend my entire career attempting to work at the White House, having no idea that I would be there at 26, or whatever age I was, can't do the math. Um, and I was, I was real, and we were surrounded by people who were animated in the same way, who were people who wanted to change society, who wanted society to evolve, to become closer to the ideal of what America can and should be, and being very hyper conscious of the fact that America exports its culture so profoundly that a shift in our culture represents a global re paradigm change. And you go, and so you think you the place you do that is the buildings with the marble floors and the fancy columns, and then you get there and you bang your head up against the wall for four or eight years. And you realize like, oh, why was that so difficult? And to me, it is not a coincidence that so many people left the Obama administration, including the Obamas themselves, and went into storytelling. Cultural work is a avenue for us to do the things we were motivated to do from the beginning, which is change society. We needed that cultural scaffolding. An idea has to exist in the imagination of a citizen before you can make policy around it, before you can build legislation around it. And so doing that cultural under, undergirding uh, became really important and became this missing piece. And so it's not just the Obamas, it's not just me. So many of my former colleagues are now in storytelling in one form or the other. And so I, though, still thought Hillary Clinton was gonna be president. 
So I left the White House in the spring of 2016, moved to New York, was like, I'm going to do creative stuff. I'm going to tell stories like this is where it's at. This is so this is what's important and started consulting for a handful of different media companies. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I I was very burnt out in my own way. It had a very intense previous 10 years. Um, And so was trying to figure out the industry, like for a minute, just was sort of like, does that mean I, I be on camera and which I found the most exhausting and horrific experience of my life. Not that horrific, but like very, I'm not suited for it in a very real way. I'd have to nap for like seven hours after being on camera for 15 minutes. It was just like the economics were never gonna work out. Um, And so uh, I I really kind of just asked people a bunch of questions and was just like, well, how does stuff get on TV? Like I couldn't have named you what a production company did five years ago. And I just had to ask and I just had to figure out what it was, how the industry actually functioned. And then what I had that I could bring to the table. There are all sorts of things that my work for the previous 10 years had equipped me to be incredibly advanced and sophisticated and, um, and well versed in. And there's all sorts of things I don't. You know, I joke in our team, we have we have about a 26 person team in our production company, Culture House. And at any given moment, the interns can absolutely school me on what we're doing. But in any given moment, I could school everybody else. Right. And so I'm a big proponent of being able to say, here's what you're good at. Here's what how it transfers, how those skills transfer and being really honest. Here's all the things I don't know. Here's all the things that I'm like, can I follow around the interns? Because I actually just found out what a gaffer did. You know, like I just don't, there's, there's gaps and I'm really humble in the face of those gaps. And I think people who are looking to transition, and I hope this gets to the answer you're actually looking for without being, I'm trying to move quickly through it, is really being clear about what you're really good at and what you bring to the table and being very clear and humble about the things that you don't have yet, but be, but you're very willing to learn and you're interested to learn. Um, and that is people want to work with people that who are, who are clear about both of those things, who are both confident in what they can do and very clear and transparent about what they can't. And people will invest in you and will find ways to like get, put you in situations where you can shine or put you in situations where you can be complimented by the work of someone else. If you are willing to show up with that kind of honesty and transparency. Absolutely. Gosh, I wish we could like go to questions right away. Cause I'm sure there's lots of questions around that. That was um, a great, yeah, a great way in shape or form to really share that. And I like in the middle about, you know, talking about how everyone is transforming in some way, shape or form across some different industries around storytelling, right? And so, and everyone we know is, is starting to do that and for all the right reasons. And so, um, so speaking of storytelling, um, Janae Desiree, um, as someone who has experience in a variety of forms of storytelling, unscripted, narrative, animation, um, and as a development exec, what are some key vital pieces that are, that you can share with the room today um, that you use as part of storytelling and in choosing material for your company to produce? Sure. Um, I think no matter what company that you're at or, or what role you have, if you're looking at potential uh, material for your company to produce, I think the first thing is you need to have a clear understanding of what your company's motto or vision is. Um, if that project is even something that they would do, if it's you know work that they've done before, you know, is it something that they're willing to explore again? Um, also looking at if that project is topical, you know, does it matter today? Uh, why, what, what's going to get people to turn on the television or to go to the theater to see it? But also, is that going to be topical and relevant in the next five years? You know, people don't realize development takes a long time. So it may work today, but <laughs> culture and things shift and the next week you're like oh why do we even care about this so you know you have to think long term as well um also who those people and collaborators are that are coming to you with the projects you know who those filmmakers are who those other producers are are there people that you want to be aligned with are are they in line with what your company wants to do are you know are they just a hot name out there but do they have anything important to say um and then honestly if the project is good like 
you can have all of these things, but if the project is just not good, if the writing isn't there, if there are elements that don't exist, you know, those are all of the things that you need to look at. Doesn't matter if it's an animated project, a film, an unscripted docu-series, you know, those are the, I think those are the pieces of the lens you need to be looking at when evaluating material. And if it's something that you believe in and you want to be the advocate for in your company to try to push up the chain. Thank you, Shanae. Um, great insight into some of the tips and the keys that you all look at when you're looking at products. Um, I'm going to switch over to Khalid um, in looking at his career path. And as a current executive at Macro, um, and you know you had that path where you worked at a, a variety of different organizations in the in the film and entertainment space. Um, what does it mean for you to be at a leadership position at a black-owned company like Macro? Um, yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, it's a privilege. It's an honor. It's really special. Um, you know, I think it's it's a lot of the magic of you know people ideating oh what if we could you know kind of have a cut through what if we could kind of like openly there's just a a cut through that we have and we all just want to make dope projects right we all want to say things that um you know are, are, are saying something you know again i think uh there's a level of you know sneaking the medicine and the food and it being entertaining and there's so many buckets that we could vary but i think macro is uh, clearly done a great job of making their mission statement, you know, to advocate and promote diverse voices in front and behind the camera. That's kind of like, you know, I don't necessarily have to explain that to every producer because I think that's kind of like, like known now. And so now it's a level of, you know, what are what are stories that are going to expand that there are more than one, you know, black experience. There's more than one, um, you know, just Asian American experience. So we want to really tap into um you know again just telling underrepresented stories as a whole and that looks like more than just period pieces it looks like more than just um you know anthology or biopics you know it's it's what are the action comedies we want to look into thrillers we want to play into um other space again it's like we have to be the ones who kind of just advocate for that and i think you know the stigma in Hollywood is, well, they're not ready, right? And it's like, well, now you got to find a uh, upper level showrunner, you know, that, you know, has ran a show and it, like, you don't, there, there's not many. And so it's now having to advocate for the person next up, you know, to give a chance to like, they've been staffed on several shows, right? Like, like, like they can do this. And so it, I think it's, it's a matter of um, really championing to buyers that, uh, you know, there, there needs to be a change of guard um, and so just and, and to you know, and it goes across the board. So I think for me to be at Macro as an executive, again, someone who can give opportunities, someone who can actually like help staff new writers, who can kind of break stories, uh, it's 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 a it's a privilege, um, and it's uh, it's just a dope feeling all around. So yeah, I like it. And I know Janae Desiree, you're in the same, similar environment at Array. Um, and I know that there's a similar lens there. Is there anything that you wanted to add to what Khalid said? I mean, you know, I second everything that Khalid said because we have very similar missions um, uh, and lenses of how we look at um, our companies and the type of work that we want to put out there. Um, I, I think the one thing that's great is, you know, I don't have to. I don't have to explain the nuances of black culture and things because my boss is a black woman. You know what I mean? The, the head of my department is a black man. My colleagues are, you know, Latinx and, you know, or just are open and have clear perspectives and are children of immigrants. So there is that shorthand, that nuance of things, of experiences that you don't have to explain um, what it is. But when I was in those, uh, in positions where I was at other companies, I absolutely did explain it because if I'm not going to be the one to explain it and to um, and to express why something is important, who else is going to do it on the team? Because I'm the only one. But it's nice when I don't have to beat it over the head because you just get it and you want to tell these important stories that are really reflective of our world. Um, so that that is that is a nice thing in the little little piece I want to add to that. Yeah, I like that. I think uh, all of us are nodding our heads around that. I think we all resonate with that, you know, pros to both being in environments where we can educate and inform because that's the only way that change that movement's going to happen, but also being in an environment where people just get it and we can just like move, move, move. So I love that. 
Um, so my next question is going to be for Bettina Fisher. Um, you know, Khalid was mentioning towards the end of his talk about how, you know, now he's in an environment where he can give back and like give opportunity to roles and in your role and which we're going to dive into a little bit later as well in your role you're really i think in majority of the time that you've been at the academy you've really been ushering in that next generation of filmmakers and of rising industry professionals so in your opinion what are some of the great traits for those that are in the room today that are that are fall in that bucket what are some of the great traits that you think um that they would need to be in order to be successful as an executive mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, I would say the ability to network and build relationships uh, because you never know where your next job is going to come from. And we often tell our interns that it's not who you know, but basically who knows you. Um, I would say also to be able to be a problem solver and an advocate for your staff, but also for yourself. Uh, as women, sometimes I feel like we don't advocate for ourselves enough. And so that's one of the other traits. And then I would also say um, to have vision and passion. I feel like everyone in this room has a passion for their job and what they do. And also to be able to pick your battles um, because everything does not have to be a battle. But if it's something that is important to you, I feel like you have to be willing to fight for it. Um, and so, yeah, those are some of the traits that I, I, I think would be really important for an executive. Those are great. You really hit that on the head. And I see all of us nodding for that too. So I know all of us have experienced a lot of that and are, are continuing to do that in as, as, in as our executive roles as well. So not just as you're climbing up, but still while you're an executive too. So that's great. Um, my next question is for Janae Marable. Um, and, you know, kind of staying with the flow of as we're, you know, ushering in the next generation type of activity, um, you as a creative executive in podcasts, where do you think the future of podcasts is going? And do you think it's an area um, that some of our industry aspiring execs should be considering? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> second question for sure. Um, my biggest, I'll start with the second one because I think it's really interesting. And as someone who didn't know the space that well and had to kind of learn it on my feet um, and learn it on the go, which I love doing, it's a very inviting, inclusive, um, and just space that people are excited for new people to enter um, and there is a lot of attention on it right now and that's a really cool way to get people who may not have an audience yet or may not have the footing of a million followers to have a voice um, because podcasting starts the voice and that's really something that's really integral to what we make um, and what i find really accessible about it is the traditional gatekeepers of hollywood don't really exist there yet <laughs> they're on their way but they don't exist there yet and so it's really about people who know each other and the networks they build and the community they build and giving others a chance to speak um, and so I think that's really informative and helpful for people who are trying to do proof of concepts of scripted shows or documentaries or different things like that. It gives them the chance to try out something, try out ideas, try out people, try out talent in a, in a pipeline that's a lot faster too. Um, so you may have an idea that you just want to, you just want to figure out if there's anything there. And it's truly just a space for experimentation, um, which I think is so fun and, and also a lot less pressure because it's going on, it's going online with thousands and thousands and millions of other um, audio things. And so the idea that it's going to make a splash is a lot less scary and can be a lot more inviting for, for new creatives. Um, and then where do I think it's going? I hope it's going to inclusion, experimentation, and curation, but we'll see. <laughs> um, I really think that there's really cool people like James Kim who are doing like binaural audio to people like Barry who runs Podcasts in Color, which is all about curating podcasts made by people of color. Um, and so people are making their voices heard and entering spaces like Tribeca and things like that to show that this is a real medium and that this is a real thing to pay attention to. Um, and I think that it's also intergenerational because it comes from um, the traditional radio. And so you have people who are in their 80s who are listening to the same thing as people who are 16. Um, and so that's something that's very different and exciting because it can be, it's much more accessible right now. It's on every platform um, and it's accessible with transcripts. So the, the ability to get it that way with people with disabilities is a lot easier. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about where it's going. I think there's a lot of opportunities um, and it also trans translates into film and TV. So people who are like, I just want a film and TV show. I'm like, well, you can make a podcast and then you can sell that and that can be a, a TV show or a film. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there, which is exciting. 
Absolutely. And so glad you're here and sharing that because I, I think those were important pieces that you hit on that not everyone thinks about when they think about podcasts. So you really kind of gave the gamut of it. And I really, really respect them and, and hone in on the facts that it's is transgener transgenerational because you don't see that in all other media forms. So um, that's something exciting. So I hope everyone out there is listening. I know I was. Um, so staying, you know, again, so we're here, we're talking about, you know, how everyone is here, we got here. Um, and this next question, I'd love to point to three of you, um, Khalid, Carrie, and Janae Desiree. Um, you know, we've spent the first few minutes talking about, you know, you all getting here, um, but to really have the real and the raw conversation that, you know, to get here, it typically, leads, a lot of the doors were closed for people of color and for people of color to rise to the ranks of being an executive. Um, so for those that are in the room, based on your own experiences and experiences of your peers, what advice or what could you recommend as um, a potential steps for a game plan or just some tips for just rising to the ranks as a person of color. I feel uh, like y'all should take this one. I'll take a stab at it. Um, I would say, <laughs> you know, I, I, it was a culture shock, I would say, coming from Howard to uh, Beverly Hills, like literally like within a month of graduation, <laughs> like it was. Um, that should have been your documentary right there. I, I mean, yeah. Um, so yeah, like, yes, yeah, seriously. Oh. It, so like, An Eddie Murphy film. There was a lot. There was just a lot going on, and just between like you know, narrowing pressure, personal pressure, just wanting to do well, to imposter syndrome, to uh, I'm literally just dealing with subtle racism, just being what it is, what it is, uh, and you know having to just i think that and still show up and still do your job right that's that's the other thing it's like it, it, there's i think a lot of um blatant things or not so blatant like elements to the job that are very personable it is a very like you know social job it is it, it, a lot of it is uh personality a lot of it is psychology and i think that's i think one of the, the pros that i've had to to have that goes on my badge is like it's it's a people thing, you know, and, and, and it being, you know, aware of just me within white spaces or just spaces that I'm not, I, I, I've just, I've known, learned how to navigate that and operate that and use that as a superpower, if you, if you will. And I think my course of my career, there was a lot of diversity and inclusion, right? And Oscars is so white. And like, so there was a lot of who are your black kids in the mail room, right? It was a lot of like, like kind of offering an opportunity and then it's like, okay, but then can you do the job? And so I think there's an element of, you may have the opportunity. There's a lot of like diversity inclusion writers program. There's a lot of things of like, you know, I think that gives the shot, but then I think there's also then a level of um, knowing that you have extra eyeballs on you, knowing that there is a certain, you know, disdain that people may think that you're a diversity hire or you're here because of whatever. It's like, you know, but still it's, it's showing up and showing out, you know, it's, it's, it's showing that you you have what it takes. Like you have to trust your inner instinct. It's, it's those things of, um, you know, just kind of getting to know yourself through it all. I know that's a lot on top of the job. I do think it is, it's, very valuable when you're navigating spaces and, and having to share your opinion on creative things and you know there's a lot of ego and like there's a lot of other variables so i would say um the least you could do is just be on your game you know at least you could do is read the script before at least you could do is look up who you're meeting with at least you could do is like do your due diligence and so i think there's an element of just, you know, knowing that you kind of already have a somewhat eye on you, um, not to give anyone a reason to, you know, say anything. I don't even know if that answered your question or not, but that was kind of It smart. does. I mean, I think you hit a lot of points and I, I, I hope everyone really honed on it. So yeah, showing up, having the opportunity, um, but then taking advantage of it, not just sitting there, but doing the at least that he said, at least reading the script, at least for showing up, at least looking up the people you're meeting with. So um, is there anyone else that wants to add anything to it? Yeah, I was just going to, I had a similar um, experience in terms of the culture shop, me being from New York, you know, very direct and we are very direct in New York. And I, I don't think that it was something, I think that's something I'm still learning that people just are not here. And hey, I am who I am. 
Um, but I also moved here when I was 25, 26, I already had started, I was already producing and I started from the beginning. So I already knew who I was when I started again as an assistant. Um, I didn't have to, to my detriment or not, I, I, I knew who I was and I think I didn't have to deal with some of the, the pitfalls of trying to find myself. But Khalid made a very important point that you need to, that's so important when you're trying to make a place for yourself as a person of color, as a black person, anyone in this industry is knowing who you are and not faltering um, just because you need to, you feel like you need to fit into something. Um, and also making sure that, you know, the one, one of the best things I did was creating that network um, or learning the things I didn't know and not being afraid to ask, you know, as an unscripted person, I never had to do coverage before in my life. So I would ask friends who were assistants, hey, I made friends with all the assistance coordinators, had informationals with them. I think a lot of times we tell people, have informationals with the people who you want to be. No, have informationals with the person whose job you actually want right now, with that assistant, with that coordinator, learn who they are, have conversations with them, because they're going to be the first people who know what jobs are opening, who can actually get your resume in the door. That's how I landed my first job at Participant was going to a mixer of assistants, meeting this guy, kicking it off. And he was like, I don't know you, but give me your resume. And that's how I ended up getting the job. And, you know, it, it's connecting with that network. And I think, you know, an organization similar to um, this one is Color Entertainment was, uh, was a great for me coming in. I was, you know, on the board and a member and really got involved. And that's how I um, created my, 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 my peers um, and my class. And now we're all climbing those ladders and it's because we had each other. So don't be afraid to set those informationals and ask those questions with the people that are in your class because you guys will be together for the rest of your lives and they have more information than you think that they do. Yeah, I think all of that's incredibly valuable. I think I'll just chime in with a couple of things. One, like there is some, there are a few things that will be as pernicious in your career life than imposter syndrome. So like do a journal, light a candle, call on the ancestors, like call your mama, like do what you need to do, but like purge that shit from your body. It is a total fallacy. It has absolutely nothing to do with the reality there. You got all these people running around this world who have no idea what the hell is going on with anything ever. And they're just, they're fine. They're thriving, right? Get out of your own way. Like whatever it takes, just get rid of it. It is not grounded in reality. Even if you have no, like I wouldn't, no one would have hired me as a development executive, but here I am like, and it's, and it's because in the perception or my own self doubts, the, the have nothing to do with my uh, capability. And if I had started to be like, well, I didn't walk and work in a mail room or I wasn't an assistant or I've never worked in entertainment. So I shouldn't have my first job be the head of development, which like art, right, there's a good case to be made that that wouldn't be true, but we have an incredible conversion rate. We have a credible uh, department. We've sold eight shows in the last two years. Like it's working. But if I had been the first person to tell myself, no, that none of that would have happened. So whatever it is that you have to do to get that out of your life, absolutely do it. Um, also, my second piece of advice would be to under to to also like, yes, we are people of color. Yes, we're black or whatever we identify as. But also when you're in an environment where that is something that is visible because it's not it's more visible because it's not replicated around you. Don't let that make you more narrow than you would be otherwise. So like read the sci-fi, go to the weird thing, go to experimental theater, check out bands of things that you may or may not be into. Uh, read books, read everything you possibly can get your hands on. Listen to everything you can possibly get. like you. There are so there's so much incredible, fantastic art in the world. There are so many people who are so incredibly brilliant and so incredible and creative that if you start to buy into this idea that because you look a particular way, because you have a phenotype, because you have a background, because your mama looks a certain way, then, and her mama's mama looks a certain way, then that, that you only exist in one space, 
like you're actually not going to be able to thrive in the world or your job as well as you possibly can. So people will project that onto you all day long. Like do not take on other people's limited view of the world for yourself and do what you want to do. And you should be able to have a conversation on any playing ground that you want to. Like there's all sorts of conversations that I can't have because I don't care. I'm not interested. And I don't want to talk about it. And I find it boring. But there's all sorts of conversations that people may look at me and be like, well, I mean, it's about Star Wars. Why would I talk to Carrie about it? Like why? Right. And then you you are able to participate in the full range of whatever it is you're interested in. And it doesn't have to be as reductive as like white things or male things or 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 young Gen Z things or Gen X, like just do what you want, but have as broad a sense of, of what's out there and what you could possibly be interested in and try something new every week, every month, whatever pace is right for you, but like get out there and see the world and like get to know what's happening. It's so rich. Um, and so many people will try and keep you in a very narrow framework of like, of being a woman or being a person of color or being a black person or being a queer person or whatever. So you have to be the one to take on the responsibility to break that framework. Don't buy into that mythology. And then finally, I would just say all of that being true, like the, the juice has got to be worth the squeeze. So <laughs> Do not let someone rob you of your health in any way, whether it's psychological, emotional, spiritual, whatever. Um, yes, opportunities are valuable. There's a lot of opportunities in the world. But every job you have, if you have to then spend six months recovering from it, how good of an, of an opportunity was that really? And you have to be really honest with yourself and like try and break the mold around some scarcity and fear. And I, and I, I recognize how ridiculous that can sound to, when you've got loans to repay, when you're trying to cover rent, when you're trying to make it in a new city, when you're trying to break into a, an, a, um, into an industry. But at the same time, like you have to be at fighting weight. We are in a creative business and all of those things sap your creativity so quickly and so dramatically that if you're in an unhealthy environment, if you're in an environment where all you're doing every day is the emotional labor of trying to exist in that environment, you're actually not going to be able to get the things you want. You're not going to be able to create on the level or perform on the level that you want. And so be mindful of that energy exchange. It is very, very difficult to exist in some of these environments. And you have to be incredibly judicious about your own capacity to function and for how long. And the minute you start getting the like, oh, I'm so tense at the idea of interacting with these people or going to this place, you gotta get out of there. You gotta make your exit strategy and you gotta do it. And you gotta bet on yourself. And that goes back to my first point that imposter syndrome is one of the greatest lies that anyone can tell themselves and you just, Seriously, light the candles, do whatever you have to do to get rid of it. Do. This was all fantastic advice. I think all three of them really hit on some really important things. And I, I'm seeing some notes in the chat where people are agreeing, agreeing to all of this. So thank you both. That, that really, those pearls of wisdom you can't get, but from a panel like this, from people that have walked the walk and are talking the talk. So appreciate it. I want to give time for Q&A. Um, I also do want to ask one more question because it parlays into everything that we were just talking about, about, you know, coming in and coming into your own and, 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 and still showing up um, and, you know, trying to get rid of the imposter syndrome. Um, there's a, what's great about this, you know, us as executives on this panel didn't have this, but for all of you in the room do have this now, a lot of the organizations are starting great programs to really allow that for you to be yourself, to be more inclusive, to foster that creativity. Um, and so I know um, one of the folks on the room, I mean, there are a lot of great programs out there. Um, and one of them is with one of the folks in the room. So I would love for Bettina, if you could just take a minute or two, um, and then we want to open up to Q&A, but um, to tell about one of the programs that really fosters it and allows a platform um, for for growth in filmmaking. Sure. Our Academy Rising program. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so the Academy Gold Rising program is a multi-tiered industry diversity internship and mentoring program under the Academy brand. 
And while we have interns at the Academy, it's also an enhancement program for interns who are at our partner companies. And our partner companies include anywhere from 20 to 25 partners uh, that are either studios, production companies, agencies, or either technical companies like Adobe or Photochem uh, or Panavision. Um, so the students have their internships during the day, and then we provide weekly panels, master classes, lunch and learns, professional development workshops, and mentors for about 100 students. The program initially starts in the summer, and it's eight weeks. And then after those eight weeks, the students get an, a mentor in their uh, area of interest for eight months. And then after that, they become alums of the program, and they can join affinity groups. Uh, they can help plan programs. We often have them come back and speak on panels. And we follow their career tra trajectory all the way up until we hope they get an Oscar. But what we can say is that this, that this program has been very successful. We have students who've gotten jobs all over the industry. And I would say about 83 or 86% of the students are working in the industry in a career path that they want to be in. So, uh, and I saw in the chat, some of our, our interns, our former interns or alumni are actually in the room. Um, but yeah, it's a great program. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Patina. Um, let's, we have just a little bit less than 10 minutes left. I would love to open up. I know there's some questions already in the, in the Q&A box. So as a reminder, um, for those of you that have questions, to so go ahead and write it in the Q&A box. And I I will read them in the order that they are received. The first question we have is from Deandra Simon. Um, her question, their question is, can you all provide insight on the non-traditional ways to become a creative executive? Similarly to Morgan Cooper's spoof concept on YouTube for, for Bel Air, which turned into a show this year on Peacock. Does anyone want to take that? I can. <laughs> I have a really untraditional path. I got here through Instagram. So <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say untraditional is is fine. It's great. Um, use the things that are your strengths to like find ways of access and entry points because the mediums and the landscape are changing. Um, TikTok is a way in now. <laughs> um, there are just so many different ways in, but a lot of it is about community. Um, a lot is a lot of it is about making friends with people, collaborating, and honing your taste, um, and finding what you really enjoy. Because if you're not enjoying it just in your free time, there's no way you're going to be enjoying it when you're doing it for 14 hours a day. Sometimes, um, so I think when you can find that for yourself, it's really helpful. But I kind of I feel like a personal example is helpful. Um, I was in accounting, <laughs> um, which is not me at all, and I would use that time to study animation in my free time and then would like listen to animation podcasts and then from there would in my free time go and make those and put them on Instagram and then just like DM people and be like hey like what are you into are you doing music videos like hey do you need help like I'm down to help you and just give me my time and just my enthusiasm I was just really excited about what other people were doing and that was authentic and I think when you have authentic enthusiasm it just gets people excited about what you want to do and makes them want to help you. Those people that I met through Instagram still help me to this day and will be like, hey, I have this project. Do you want to like help me? Or like, do you know anybody? Um, and so I think like the Peacock thing is that's much, much more common nowadays because people are seeing that those are ways people can have access um, where there isn't access. And from the Midwest to just smaller towns, it's a lot easier to find it through the internet and find ways to that. So I would say find like your people, whether that's on the internet or in real life, and then use that to your advantage, but also use that in a very authentic way to just be excited about what you're making and what you wanna create. Fantastic. And what a you know, better person to answer that, Shanae. I love your, I love that. Didn't even know that piece about you. So that's great. Um, does anyone else want to add to that? All right. We'll go to the next. Khalid, is that a yes or no? No, you're good. I was like, because I, I have a very exec perspective of it. I think what she said is brilliant and yes, definitely uh, helpful in, in that sense. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so the next question looks like it was partially answered, um, Nigel, Nigel, um, but I'm going to read it in case someone else wants to chime in. Um, 
This is a real question. Um, being a black exec and being around other black execs, when developing and working on projects, do you still face biases from um, BIPOC within your offices, specific within your offices, specifically colleagues or bosses? And if so, were and or are there any tools that you can use to confront them? And Nigel astutely pointed out, Carrie really just answered that question um, in her last piece that she was just talking about, um, but didn't know if anyone else wanted to chime in. I mean, let's not give up, let's not perpetuate this lie that black people can't be toxic. <laughs> I mean, like, that happens that toxicity is an equal opportunity uh path to go down so of course you can work with people of color or women or whatever and have it not be a healthy safe enjoyable environment and so you know and and it might feel it might be for different reasons but it's fundamentally driven by scarcity or insecurity or any of the num myriad reasons that people get weird with one another um, and so I, I'm a big advocate of not trying to endure that. I do not think that our ability to suffer uh, in silence is a testimony to our strength or our brilliance. I think when you're in that kind of environment, the best and first thing you should do is to just get yourself as far away from it as you possibly can, as soon as you can. Yeah, I was just going to, I was just going to add, you know, I think also as far as like your team, it's knowing, you know, who's had who's superpower like who who's in, who's interested in what what's their interest are they the anime person are they the like and i think that's just honestly like our bot like knows that and, and, and there's a i think there's a, a just and i'm just talking from my experience of you know how macro because it wasn't that way in every job right so like I'm a, like other different boss who would just send me every period anthology you know whatever sports project you know i used to play football at howard but like you think i'm into sports i'm not so carry to your point it's like there is a level of like just no and people putting that on you and then it's like oh yeah well i just figured that well you didn't say anything you just turned around the coverage and you know it was it's always like but that's not my interest you know or i actually want to do more comedy and like there's a level of i think uh just being aware of that so as projects come in and like there's a level of okay this is for me so and so should read this right like they'll actually get this mythology like it's a lot i don't understand this period post a lot post apocalyptic type of world you know there's a i think there's different uh projects and and gamuts that that are that may fit different executives better and so i think you know what i may not like or fancies like me may actually gone through someone else and it's their passion project and it was a personal attachment that they had to it or whatever but i do think that um you know there is a level of stereotyping um you know projects or or you know who should point on it based off of just you know appearances or what you think but I, um i don't think it's that much I was just gonna say, um, to piggyback off of what they both said um, and something Bettina said about knowing when to choose your battles, but at the same time, at the same time, if someone is coming to you and putting you in a box or being toxic in any way, also knowing how to communicate that to them and advocate for yourself, because if you don't put a stop to it, they will continue to do it. Um, and also if you are in a position where there are younger execs under you, if you feel comfortable and whoever that other person is that might be putting them in a box, advocating for someone else who may not have the voice to speak up for themselves. Um, you know, that's, I've, I've done that in, in the past. I've had to advocate for myself when, when someone had an idea of what my department is and put me in a box. And I said, no, 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 we're not gonna do that because this is not the, this is the exact opposite reason of why I'm here. Anytime that I've had confrontations, it's just, you know, you can always respectfully check someone um, and, and no matter what your position is, you shouldn't feel like you don't have a voice because you do have a voice. So that's, that's just the last piece that I'll, I'll share. Um, spot on everything everyone said. Uh, Janae, you answered, I was just going to ask, I'm like, what if they feel like they can't advocate for themselves and you answered it right there, or then find someone who can advocate for you. And I think that's a really, really valuable piece as well. Um, all right, great. So we are at the top of the hour. I um, am going to turn it over back. And I'm sorry, I know Harvey and Desmond, you both have questions. I'm going to turn it back over to our hostess with the mostest, Tatiana, um, to let us know about next steps. 
Definitely. Well, thank you everyone for this amazing panel. I know that I just sitting here watching as a fan <laughs> took away so much from what you all shared. I'm so sorry that we were able to get to more questions, uh, but please email mm -hmm. us at Young Entertainment Activists and we'll try our best to get your uh, questions answered. Um, and that is basically all the time we have for, but I want to thank Niti for a phenomenal, beautiful, incredible job moderating. I want to thank our incredible panelists for taking their time. I hope you as viewers really took away just the historical part that all of us could really come together and make this happen because it's not often times when we talk about the Hollywood C-suite that we talk about development that we see our faces, right? So we really empowered people today. So I hope that you all as panelists walked away with that. And thank you so much for our audience for watching. Thank you all and have a great night.